Dr. Dana Peters, uh, who's a professor in radiology and biomedical imaging. Uh, she's going to talk about valvular flow MRI, 2D phase contrast of the tricuspid valvular flow with automated valve, valve tracking by deep learning. Thank you. Thank you. It's really awesome to be here um, presenting to my brilliant colleagues in, um, at Yale School of Medicine. And um, my name is Dana Peters. I'm a professor in radiology and bioimaging sciences. So um, magnetic resonance is very powerful in um, imaging the heart, but it's lacking in techniques for evaluating diastolic function. Diastolic function is really vital, for example, in patients with heart failure preserved EF, and that is um, present in about 3 million Americans and is increasing. So diastolic dysfunction can identify elevated cardiac pressures in the heart that lead to pulmonary edema and heart failure. Um, MRI can definitely evaluate some of the key biomarkers of diastolic dysfunction, including EA and left atrial volume, but it's not really able to measure E prime or tricuspid regurgitant jets. So this shows um, that we can measure left atrial volumes, um, and that is definitely a biomarker for elevated pressure in the heart. You see the, the left ventricle and the left atrium, which is highlighted, and higher volume means higher pressure. And we can also measure with many techniques um, E and A velocity. So this shows a phase contrast image. You can see the anatomic image and the velocity map. And the velocity map gives you um, measurement of velocity throughout the cardiac cycle in the left ventricle. And you can see the filling velocities, which are E and A, in early and late diastole um, change with elevated pressure. So it's an important biomarker of elevated pressure. Um, magnetic resonance um, methods cannot really measure E prime or tricuspid um, regurgitant jet velocity. And this just shows how important E prime is. Here you can see that in this very old paper that um, E over E prime is um, a surrogate of pressure in the heart. And it's also known to be a powerful predictor of outcomes. Um, and it also is one of the five key parameters for diastolic function. And similarly, tricuspid regurgitant velocity, if it's elevated, it indicates, it, it predicts um, um, major adverse cardiovascular events. And you can also see that it's a key parameter in diastolic function, and, and it's really important. So it would be very valuable to be able to add these to um, MRI's ability to measure parameters of diastolic dysfunction. So we really wanted to do this. Um, we, we think it's, a, it's pressure is one of the most important unmeasurable methods with MRI. And so this is work from Lund and Yale University where we had a feature tracking technique. And so we very carefully measured these red and blue points. So this is the, this is the mitral insertion, annular insertion points. We measured it in end isolate, we measured, measured it in end and we could calculate displacement curves. And from displacement curves, of course, you can take the derivative and calculate velocity. So we were able to measure um, E prime, septal and lateral, similar to echocardiography. And this was like, you know, exciting, but it's, and, and it was really using these very standard techniques that I think you showed, we showed in a couple of presentations ago. There, um, it's, it's a ubiquitous technique that is acquired in every MRI scan for cardiac imaging. So, but it was very laborious and um, it took maybe 10 minutes to, for a patient and it actually was not that easy to do. Like I can actually, I can't actually annotate these valve points with enough accuracy to measure the velocity. So, and in, the, in, the, in, in this, um, in doing this work, we really generated this huge database of precise valve tracking. So of course it was, 2019, so we said, can we use deep learning to automatically track the mitral valve? And here you can see our framework. Um, we had 700 subjects. We had multi-vendor, multi-scanner technique. We had expert annotations, and we actually did this in MATLAB. So this we used uh, um, input two-chamber and four-chamber cines, did a course annotation just to standardize the image, and we developed a network to do that course annotation. And then we using the standardized images, we were able to use and develop a new network to precisely track the mitral valve. And so you can see, and then we output that as just tracked, tracked points on the original CINI. 
and I can just show you, um, this was the ResNet 50 network that we used. So this worked. Um, we are able to develop AI tools to track the valves. Um, here you see the left ventricle, and you can see that we're able to measure E prime automatically now. And um, we looked at the, the metrices and we have accurate, um, accurate automatic tracking up to three millimeters. And we also had accurate measurements of MAPC and E prime. And so it was pretty exciting. And then we went on to actually develop a, a database for the tricuspid valve. So this is the right heart and you can see the four chamber and we're tracking the right heart now. We're actually also tracking on the RV two chamber view, which is a pretty rare view, but um, it's here we're actually being able to track that also. So that was exciting. So we actually can measure E prime. And um, so, so then we still have a question about tricuspid regurgitant velocity. And there's a problem with tricuspid regurgitant velocity, which actually relates to the motion of the valve. So if you try to measure the flow through the valve, since the valve plane is moving, as you can see in the orange slice, which is tracking the valve, if you use a if you use some kind of slice which is static, like the white slice, you're going to get you're going to be able to image the valve sometimes and not others. So it's it's a problem. So, but we realized, but we we have developed this technique to um, track the tricuspid valve, so we can actually input our deep learning um, framework into the MRI scanner so and, and prescribe a moving slice. So I just wanna mention um, that here's the, so here's, here's the framework that we used. We got RV two chambers and four chambers. We um, put it into our deep learning network, TVNet, and we developed a dynamic slice prescription. So this is all done automatically. Um, and then we were able to send the scanner a file of new slice prescriptions to acquire during the scan. And here you see um, the dynamic valve tracking um, measurement. So you see the anatomical image and the, and the, um, and the velocity image. And so we're successfully able to, to do this. Um, so here we validated the valve tracking phase flow measurement um, compared to the reference standard, which is stroke volume based on the RV planimetry. And you can see that it's um, well validated in healthy subjects. And then we um, actually were, have started to image patients. Um, and here you can see that, that when we put a slice um, on the um, above the valve, you can see a jet, which is a tricuspid regurgitant jet. And in the anatomic and velocity map, you can see right in systole, there's a there's this sharp jet. And it's um when we correlated it to echocardiography, we can see that the velocity, the maximum velocity matches um perfectly. So this is a patient with a TR jet where we actually were able to measure that TR jet. And that's what you really need for diastolic dysfunction. Um, and so I, it's, it's, so we feel like this has been an exciting, um, is, AI has really helped in developing tools for diastolic dysfunction because we already had tools for these velocity measurements and LA volume, but now we have developed new tools for E prime and TR jet velocity, although that has to be validated. And, and also it was, it's, we've also been able to, um, integrate our, our tools into a, um, a commercial product, Medviso, um, and this shows, um, this was just a couple weeks ago, Ricardo Gonzalez, who worked on much of this work um, with the new tools that have been put into a commercial platform freely available for researchers. So I wanna thank everybody um, for listening and also especially um, Ricardo Gonzalez and Felicia Saman and the Magnetic Residence Research Center, and thank you. Thank you so much. Well, that's, that's excellent. 
Uh, you know, as a cardiologist, of course, I love this presentation. Uh, and the color, colorful pictures that start that morning is all uh, is beautiful. And I, I think uh, when, before I ask questions, I have a plug-in for Yale Ventures. Uh, so uh, Yale Ventures is this uh, organization that uh, is a new group that formed a year and a half ago and is actually uh, focusing on AI development innovation. And so if you are developing technologies that have uh, impact and translation, there are actually seed grants available through Yale. And I'm a, one of the proud recipients of one of those grants. And uh, Dr. Grassi, who's back there, would uh, and uh, so she, the special shout out to her because the group's really looking at ideas today that can actually go to patients. And a big challenge there is resources. And, you know, Real Ventures really helps figure out what that uh, looks like. So thank you uh, for putting that plug in the end that you have uh, uh, products that are actually going to be used in practice. Um, one of my key questions that I'll start with and I'll uh, uh, then take the question from the audience is, uh, how are you inter thinking about uh, the deployment of this in practice? And especially because patients are going to come with echocardiography information often. Does this supplement it in a certain way? Are there additional features that are extracted that are more useful or is it more reliable? Great. That's, that's a really good question. I mean, my, my view is maybe that we, we know that echocardiography has some limitations. I mean, it's cheap and portable and it's a ubiquitous, so that that's great. But why should an MRI scanner, which is, which is more, um, be able to do a whole exam and not know anything about diastolic dysfunction? To me, that's a challenge. And the other, the other matter is that in MRI, we there's a trend towards like low field imaging. We want to have accessible imaging. We're thinking about 20 minute exams, 30 minute exams, and so in that case, if we had a more accessible scanner that was less less expensive. And a short exam, maybe it's justifiable just to evaluate diastolic dysfunction. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to take the audience question next. Just wanted to say I, I really appreciated um, that motion and, and imaging has been such a longstanding problem, and people have wanted to be able to follow the the anatomy forever. And and this is such an elegant and creative use of MRI to to make that really feasible. I just wonder if you had other thoughts on what other kinds of motion that the, or what other kinds of imaging this could be applied to, like maybe respiratory or... Um... Yeah, I, I think that that this, the technique that I presented has actually been, was, was actually presented in the, like 10 years ago, but there was no deep learning. And so all we're doing is in, like adding deep learning to to this motion tracking that was before very, challenging and now it's it's pretty easy um in terms of other 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 ways to use this technique it seems like there's many ways for example when you're doing um any kind of sending imaging you're you're never actually imaging the same tissue during the cardiac cycle so if you could do um slight sli slice following you'd actually be able to image the same tissue that might be important for example for um, for tagging, for strain imaging, I guess. Thank you. Uh, we'll take one more audience question. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, are there any toolkits available or in development right now powered by large language models where a simple user such as myself can drag and drop um, and select one image modality such as CT, MRI, or ultrasound with respective metadata, as well as other clinical lab biomarkers phenotypes and genotype data to create a clinical grade predictive model automatically. Right. I I think um we I have heard about that. Like we were just at the Star Society of Cardiovascular MR and that was discussed as something where you can drag and drop and it gives you a diagnosis, um, at least for in the brain. Um, but um I haven't heard about it for the heart, which is a less common, at least in terms of MRI. Yeah. 